Eeny miny mo. Testing on the radio. Eeny miny miny mo. Testing on the radio. Eeny miny miny mo. Testing on the radio. All right, Pete Giuliano, you're up early this morning. Thank you for making a sacrifice and being here with us during busy times for you. It is Monday, September 19, 2022. Pete, what number is that? Solder smoke 240. 240. Here we are. Here we are. 240. Wait a second. I'm looking like I'm recording a whole lot of audio here, but that's okay. I'll just just leave it like that. We we forgot to say, crank it in. I know, man. We both crank it in, Robert. <laughs> crank it in, Ralph. Crank it in, Robert. Crank it in, Ralph. Yeah, crank it in, guys. There you go. <laughs> okay. Um, hey, uh, uh, Pete. A lot, lot to cover today, and I know this is a real busy time for you. So I'm really, we got to, I want to get everything done here in an efficient manner. First, I got to mention Hurricane Fiona is hitting the Dominican, Dominican Republic, Republic, yeah, right now as we speak. It made landfall about an hour ago, and uh, it it did a real number on on Puerto Rico. We, you know, sympathies go out to all of our. Uh, Puerto Rican friends down there in KP four land, but now it's hitting hitting the DR, and we're um, we're a little bit concerned. It hit the eastern tip of the island, and uh, it had sustained it had wind gusts of up to seventy nine miles an hour at the Punta Cana airport. That's I think they'll they'll be able to cope with it. Okay, I think it'll be all right. Is it, is there someone that's with your mother in law that can take care of her during this? Oh yeah, we have. There, there's plenty of people. It's it's uh, oh, Elisa's, okay. Elisa's mom's in good shape. She's in Santo Domingo in an apartment, so she's well protected. And there's plenty of people around to take care of her. That's 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 fine. So we're okay. But thanks for asking. Hey Pete, I found out that there's an acronym that may apply to both of us. Ooh. It's called NIM cells. We, you and I, may be NIM cells. I read about this in the in the Washington Post. Let me tell you what the acronym stands for. And I don't. I'm not sure whether it really applies to us. I'm gonna we're gonna have to ask our our viewing audience and listening audience. By the way, it's a whole new world now that we're on video. I have to shave before we do the show. I have to make I myself to presentable. My you combed your hair. I mean, <laughs> the sacrifice. People don't appreciate yeah. the sacrifices that we make for our listening audience. But anyway, <laughs> NIM cells, niche internet micro celebrities. Ooh, it sounds so cool. It does and it doesn't. Niche internet micro celebrities. Okay, look, we're definitely in a niche. You know, if you're if you're talking about homebrew ham radio, you're in a niche of a niche. You're a sub niche. All right. We're on the internet, no doubt about it. That's what all this uh, techno stuff around us here is about. Um, that's why I'm not on my D104 microphone. I'm on this thing. But anyway, um, but I don't know about micro. Micro, it's kind of demeaning. And then celebrities. Well, within within our niche, we're celebrities. So maybe we should say that it's niche internet major celebrity, Pete Giuliano. Uh, You're a nimcel, but it's with major. But major. then the other th the other reason, Pete, I was thinking, I don't like the whole nimcel thing. It's maybe a generational thing, but to me it sounds too much like numbskull. <laughs> <laughs> and and I was talking to to Maria's boyfriend about this, and he's kind of techno savvy. And and he said, "Ooh, he doesn't like it because it sounds like incel, which is a whole other thing." And we we're not we're not even going to talk about that. But I don't know. Let me ask. Let me throw this out to our listening audience. Can you guys think of an acronym that would describe what Pete and I are doing on the internet? It may be along the lines of nimcel, but something like that. Anyway, I, I I throw it out to the audience, Pete. I'm sure we're going to get some really fantastic suggestions from our listeners and, and viewers these days you know i was just doing the math yeah There's seven seven hundred thousand seven hundred thousand hams licensed hams in the u.s and maybe one percent of those are home brewers that gets down to seven thousand people well i i i always thought yeah it's it's a niche it's a niche <laughs> i always thought the number was like for us was closer to three thousand you know if, if you notice three thousand is a number yeah, that comes up like <laughs> but I, we don't care. Even if there was three, we would be out there oh, doing yeah, this. Yeah. We, Audience we, we, of one. <laughs> that's it, man. The the few, the proud. Here we are. Hey, uh, and we have sponsors, Pete. That's another thing. We have sponsors, which means, in the grand scheme of things, we're we're worthy. This week we have two sponsors. Two. Ooh. 
first, I'm going to mention the first one. Then I'm going to talk about the second one at the midpoint when we get to the, 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 um, the what do we call it? The um, shameless commerce episode. But right now, let's talk about parts candy. This is our friend Carlos in Chicago. Carlos is the guy who makes the test leads that you and I have been using. You know, I'm preparing my shack in the, the Dominican Republic, S solder smoke shack south. So I asked Carlos to send me some additional leads, and he did. And so I am. I think this is going to be a, make a major contribution to whatever home brewing that I'm doing down there south of the border in the tropics. Um, and they're really nice. And the thing that's nice about them is he hand makes them all. They've got the standard alligator clips on either side of the wire, but in in contrast to his competitors, Carlos actually solders the wire to the clip, which is important. And I'm the one who came up with the the, the phrase for this. Don't scrimp with a crimp. Because what they do, all the other manufacturers, they just take that alligator clip. They don't even strip away the insulation. They just jam it in there and crimp, and they hope that it makes contact. Sometimes it does. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't, which is exactly what you don't want when you're putting a test lead on a circuit. You want to know whether you're, you're powering it or not. And so anyway, don't scrimp with a crimp. Contact Carlos. Get some of his parts candy uh, test leads. They're really fantastic. Pete, I know you've you've used them and you've liked them. I I want to add uh, the bonus feature of his test leads. And for instance, like on your oscilloscope leads, they have like a boot o over the contacts. Right. That boot keeps slipping off. He adds a keeper on the boot. He has like a piece of shrink tubing on the boot, so the 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 boot the uh, covering, the insulating covering doesn't slip back. It's so, not. So when you clip it on, it's not going to touch anything else. And that is significant because I have shorted more, <laughs> more things out <laughs> because the ground lead touched something. And then the smoke comes out. Yeah, then the smoke comes out. Yeah. Hey, they are superb. And they're just the right length. Like, for instance, most of the VOMs have pointy test leads. They don't clip on. So with the with his test leads, you can alligator clip to the test leads and then, you know, put them in the circuit and not have to be juggling around with your hands in that. They are superb. Uh, really good. And and he's coming out. He's expanding his line. He sent me he sent me some that have like the little leads that you would put on if you wanted to put and you wanted to leave it there. But it was a smaller connector like it kind of grabs it and it's good for putting probes on for for like oscilloscopes and everything else. So he's expanding his uh, his his offer. But check it out. He's on on eBay. Go to parts candy. Just go to eBay and then search uh, then search for uh, for parts parts candy. You, or you could just go to the to the to the image that I have on the left hand side of the solder smoke blog. Click on that; it'll take you to Carlos's page. Carlos is one of us. He's a he's an electronics tinkerer, uh, and he's he's going to send us some videos of some of the stuff that he did when he was learning about electronics back in Mexico. But um, he he's based in Chicago right now. He's working. He's a busy guy. He's working with Apple. He recently moved house, and so but but he's running parts candy and. You know, if you're looking for for test leads, which would be a major addition to your your workbench, your your workshop, uh, don't scrimp with a crimp. Go with Parts Candy. Tell yeah. them you tell them a the solder smoke sent you. We'll talk about the other sponsor when we get to the Shameless Commerce Division. But Pete, there's something else in this area, this commercial area that I wanted to mention to you. I think somebody has been using some of our terminology, and I'll I'll have to contact. Uh, Steve Silverman, who's our lexicographer about this also. But I was watching TV the other night, um, and an ad came on for this company, Carvana. Carvana yeah. is the company that sells you the used car. They, supposedly they have a dispensing machine that spits out cars. Okay. But they use a phrase. They say that they, they sell their cars using, quote, techno wizardry. That's ours, isn't it? Yes. International Brotherhood of Electronic Wizards. Yes. Wizardry. I, I, you know, I was mildly concerned about this. I'm going to have to contact our lawyers at Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe to see if something can be made of this claim. This, they, we can't let people just throw around the wizardry thing. Techno wizardry, no less. I don't know. I ask, I ask our, 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 uh, our clients. I ask our customers, our, our listeners, 
what they think about the use of techno wizardry by other companies. And should we get Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe mobilized oh, to beat this threat? Of course. Of course. All right. Pete, not to talk about benches. And I, I've been I've been more active than than you have. Although I like your background there. That's a that's a really you got a, you got some two. <laughs> it's kind of a scary look at it. it. Looks like it looks like it looks like a defunct HW one hundred and one that's seriously defunct. Well, it's a temple one. Uh, there you go. We'll we'll talk about that in a minute. But listen, first I got a confession to make. I've become a DXer. Yes. And I blame the hex beam. I was not a DXer before the hex beam. Before I was, you know, kind of indifferent whether I talked to somebody from, you know, England or Ethiopia or, you know, Illinois. It didn't matter to me. But now I am a, 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 a ravenous DXer. And I'm doing all the DXer things. That's because of the hex beam. All right. Here's some of the things that, that the signs that you may have become a DXer. First, I incessantly watch the DX spots page, DX watts. Watch, and I'm looking for spots of places that I need. <laughs> now, why do I need them? <laughs> I, well, because I'm trying to get to, uh, I'm trying to work DXCC and see how long it takes with the hex beam. Do you, do you realize you've added 40 countries since our last podcast? I'm at 91. Yeah, so I'm, you were 51 before, you're 91 now, that's 40 countries. 91, and, and it's, it's fun too, and it's a good mix too. I get, I get places that are, are just kind of rare. I'm having, I'm great, having great fun with it. But well, that's one thing. I watch the spot pages. Here's the other sign that you're a DXer. I have actually gone through the trouble, the contortions, the techno contortions of yes, signing up for logbook of the world. Logbook of the world. I'm on the logbook of the world. Now, I, I did this because, and I was telling Dean about this, that I, I originally had this notion, this will be great. I'll sign up for logbook of the world, and I'll just look, and going back to 19... 79, I'll realize that I've made DXCC like 14 times, and all of these confirmed contacts will just spill out of the computer at me, right? But no, it doesn't work that way. You have to put them into the system too, right? Or else nobody would do it. Everybody would be just sitting there waiting to get their contacts. But if you put it in the system, and the other party has put it in the system, and they match, boom, then you get a confirmed a confirmed QSO, and you don't have to do the business about mailing, you know, postcards to Timbuktu and things like that. Although I like the old way. Uh, but anyway, he, but we, Dean and I were talking about this. The thing is, like I was for many years, many countries are not, many, many stations are not participating in Logbook of the World. So of the, the 91 countries or 91 DX entities that I've worked, I've confirmed 30. Which is not bad. I haven't sent I haven't I haven't sent out a single postage stamp, but through Logbook of the World, about thirty of them have come back confirmed, and more of them will come in back in the future because some of these guys only will upload their contacts every few months. So over time, things will improve, I think. But I'm having fun. I think I'm going to quit when I'm at, when I reach a hundred. I'm just going to quit, um, and then um, go back to normal operation. I'm not going to I'm not going to worry about getting a certificate from the ARRL or anything like that. No, I don't care. It's it's like kind of a personal achievement thing. But but Pete, you know, it's it's the difference that the hex beam makes. Let me let me just say this. Just on Friday, on Friday of last week, I got on and I worked three stations. I worked Mozambique on the long path. Wow. 16,000 miles. And and you you get to know the guy. The guy who's doing it is Bill Bill lives in South Africa and in Mozambique, and he moves back and forth between the two locations. And so I, I've worked him in South Africa. Now I caught him in, in, in Mozambique on the long path. He likes the long path. Then I worked the island of San Andres, which wow. is it's, a, it's an island belonging to Colombia, but off the coast, the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua. I've been there. I, I landed in a plane there one time. And then the third station, all on Friday, Saudi Arabia. Um, yeah, and, and there was a big pile up and everything. And I called the guy. All, all of this is done with either the Mythbuster or the 1712 homebrew rig, and all of it on sideband. Um, but I, I called him, and then he gave me we had, his name is Ahmed. We had a really nice contact. And he said, You're it, Bill. You're the last one. I'm going to QRT now. Got to go. Boom. <laughs> like, 
you know, mic drop, ham radio mic drop. There you go. But yeah, so DXing, it's fun. And it, 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 it makes you kind of, it, it causes you to be aware of things that you weren't thinking about before, like beam headings, the gray line, when the band is open at different parts of the world. I mean, I talk to, to, South, to Australia and, and Japan like all the time. They're, they're like routine contacts now. And I must say, the, the hex beam, I think, makes the big difference. It really, it really does. So um, three cheers for K4KIO and the hex beam. I, I, I'm really having a lot of fun with that. Hey, I wanted to make a quick comment because uh, maybe some modern day hams that are DXing uh, are not aware of the old system, like uh, international reply coupons, IRCs, green stamps, green stamps. Green stamps. And, and the thing is, if you wanted a QSL from these uh, exotic places before logbook of the world, you'd have to send IRCs or green stamps, which is dollars, <laughs> dollars. A green right. stamp is a dollar to get a QSL card back. And so you always worry because some of these um, countries, uh, the postal system, they'd open them up and take the money, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> I came up with a system. I got a QSL card on the front, a QSL card in the back. I'd slip money in between the QSL cards and laminate it. <laughs> so yeah. when the guy got at the other end, he'd cut the laminate, pull out the money, but the guy in the post office wouldn't realize the money's in there. But I mean, terrible things we did just to get a QSL card. And, and they were, I think when they, when they were trying to trying to talk about the advantages of logbook of the world, they were saying just in the old days, just in, in postal fees, to get to DXCC, you'd have to spend something like 300 bucks. And you know that was a lot of money back then. It still is, you know. And and for 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 the certificate. But now logbook of the world. It's yeah. it's but go. it's not as fun as going out to the mailbox and finding the QSL card from ZL two ACP. I still have my ZL two ACP QSL. That was great fun. Oh, this is the other sign that you become a DXer. I actually sent envelopes to the bureau. Yes, yes. I sent in my money, so I get I got envelopes at the at the bureau, and I, I every time I go to the mailbox, I'm hoping that there's a big fat envelope full of QSL cards. But you got to send the right size envelope. I just send money. Told them. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but anyway, I, I, one of these days, I'm hoping to get an envelope like that because it, it'll be nostalgic. It'll be like the old days of getting those cards. All right, so uh, a DXer, at least for the moment. Um, hey, but, Pete, I want to also mention that, um, you know, you, you do this and I do this too, that we, where you kind of go back and work on a rig that you built many years ago. And it's, it's amazing when you go back with kind of with, a new, with new eyes and look at the rig that you built a long time ago, and you could see all kinds of mistakes that you made back then. Or now that you understand the circuit better, you know, when you know stuff, you can do stuff, as 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 you've you've told us. So I pulled out my first real homebrew station. It was the Bare Bones or Bar- Barbados Super Hat by uh, by Doug Demore. Yeah, paired up with the the VXO Six Water out of QRP Classics, and this was designed by W One VD. Um, and so I just said, okay, let me get this thing going. I, I had to to, to kind of rep- do some mods, repair some stuff that I had done. But I got the receiver going. Now, the receiver is unusual because it's got the IF at 3.579. It's got a color burst IF. It's got a color burst crystal filter. Pete, I think this makes it the world's only CBLA receiver. We've put out a lot of Michigan Mighty Mites that are CBLA transmitters. But I just realized when I was looking at this thing, I too have a CBLA receiver, color burst Liberation Army receiver. I had I had modified DeMar's uh crystal filter and broadened it so I could listen to, to phone on 20 meters for some reason, but I decided that was kind of silly. So I moved it back. I just used the, uh, the, the values in the schematic that, that DeMar had used, because when I built this thing, I had no idea really how to characterize the, the, uh, motional parameters of a crystal. So I had no hope of, of designing the filter properly. So I just took whatever values of capacitors that, that, that DeMar had and plugged them in there and it worked out Worked out pretty well. Um, and then for the uh, for the transmitter, well, the transmitter I had built in the Dominican Republic back in 93. And then when I was trying to get my double sideband transmitter working, I chopped the, the RF amplifier off the board and used that as the RF amplifier because I couldn't get an RF amplifier to be stable back then. 
you live and learn, you grow. Um, so I rebuilt the crystal oscillator, put it back in the box, and got on the air with this thing. Oh, here's the other thing. This was kind of a cool mod. You know, I used Farhan's Antuino to take a look at the passband of the filter that I built. And, you know, it was a little bit different from what Doug DeMaw had described. It was lower in frequency. Instead of uh, 3579, it was a little bit lower. And the way the circuit was, he, he had it so that the BFO crystal, which was also 3579, could be moved up. But if I moved it up, I was moving it away, far away from the passband of the filter. Or on which the is, slope. Right, right. Which, but 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 it was even beyond that. So I could I could hear CW signals, but but the tone was very high pitched, and I could not hear down to where it was going into zero beat. So it was not in the right place. It should be about you know six or seven hundred hertz above the peak of the crystal filter on CW. So I'm looking at this thing. I'm thinking, how am I going to do this? What am I going to do? And I looked. I realized that DeMaw had a trimmer capacitor in series with the 3579 crystal in the BFO. And, you know, when you know stuff, you can do stuff. I said, well, that, that, that cap is just going to move it further up, which is not what I want. I want it to be moving down in the opposite direction so I could get it closer to the peak of the crystal filter passband. And I realized that if I took that trimmer and moved it from in series and just moved it to parallel, then it would have the effect of moving the crystal frequency in the opposite direction. So I pulled out the soldering iron, zip, 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 boom. It took about two minutes, but then I was able to move that thing right where I wanted it. I've got some pictures of all this up on the, uh, the Solder Smoke blog, but it was a very, it was a satisfying little mod of an old, old rig. And Pete, it really made me think of what you say, when you know stuff, you can do stuff. Because I was just trying to figure out what to do and just looking at it, and I realized, okay, move the move the move that trimmer cap to parallel. Boom. Tribal wisdom, tribal knowledge. I probably got that from you. And good stuff. Hey, um, one thing I want to mention, I have become increasingly active in the Vienna Wireless Society. Largely because our good friend Dean, KK4 DIS, is the president and providing, I think, really inspiring leadership to the group. We have uh, lunches, lunches every Tuesday. We have lunch at a local restaurant. That is not Hooters, by the way. Not, don't don't get the idea. Because, but but Dean was telling me that um, that uh, one of the XYLs in the group calls these lunches the Romeo lunches. You know what that is? Yes. Higher than commuting out. Yes. <laughs> So we go to the Romeo lunch, and uh, and also Dean has has launched the Makers Group. So it's a, it's a, it, the Vienna Wireless Society has about three hundred members. It's a pretty big club, and but there's a very small subset, maybe a dozen, maybe fifteen guys, who are involved in building stuff. Which goes back to your theory of the small percentage of hams that are actually home brewing. And uh, but but we get together uh, on Zoom once every two weeks and talk about projects and tales of woe and things that we've learned and so it's it's a lot of fun and I uh, I've, I've been having fun I'm, and I'm just really enjoying being a wireless society. There, there's some colorful people in that group. That guy Don that puts the LEDs. Oh, Don, <laughs> character, yes, he, he likes LEDs on all the stages, and I'm with him on that. I I, I showed my LED for that I have on the LM386. Yeah, yeah. Yes, there are, there are. And and Dwayne, Dwayne is active, even though he's not in Northern Virginia, but he 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 calls in. It's good to have Dwayne there, and, oh, and yeah. it, it, it's a good bunch. It's really it really is good. They put the uh, Dean puts the the videos up on the on the internet. I think it's they're they're there for all all to see. But hey, this this gets to something that we were talking about in the makers group and that is Farhan's daylight again analog rig Farhan has designed this rig he uh, he made it he, he presented it at a recent uh, QRP event but then the video of it didn't didn't make it onto the internet and so I got a copy I won't say how or who gave it to me but I got a copy of the video and put it up on the blog it's there Farhan gave me permission to put it up but it's his presentation of the Daylight Again analog rig. And it's got some really interesting features in there. He, I think, Pete, was in part reacting to your comments about we just keep building the same bid X rig over and over again. He wanted to do something different. 
So there's a lot of different stuff in there. There's no more diode ring mixers. He makes the mixers out of two J310s, forming in effect a, uh, a, a, a you know a dual gate MOSFET, just like you've done on your earlier rigs. Uh, he doesn't use a, a, a standard VFO, nor does he use an SI5351. He goes and builds a version of the PTO, the permeability tuned oscillator that Collins pioneered. And this is what really caught our eye. So Dean, Dean has a 3D printer. Dean also has a CNC machine, as you know. But Farhan put the, uh, the files for the coil form that's really the heart of the, the PTO up on the Internet. And Dean got it. And he printed out one for him and one for me. So this is the advantage of having a friend who has this machinery, right? So this got Dean and I to building the PTOs. Uh, I built the one that's straight out of the uh, Daylight Again rig. Dean's was a little bit different. Dean built a Colpitz uh, version. My the, the Daylight Analog Daylight Again Analog rig has a Hartley oscillator. Dean's built one with a Colpitz. And I was having a heck of a time getting mine stable. But I was getting reports from Farhan and others that this thing is really stable. So I knew something had to be wrong with my version of it. But it wasn't stable. And the weird thing is it wasn't drifting down in frequency, which is what you usually get. This thing was drifting up in frequency, which usually indicates that there's a problem in the capacitors, not in the coil. The coil will make it drift down. The capacitors usually will make it drift up. So we started, I started saying, okay, I got to find out what's causing the drift. And I, I, I came up with a kind of a different technique. So what I would do, the first thing I did is let's look at the coil. I pulled the coil out of the rig and I put the coil across my LC meter. Then I pull out the hot air gun. Boom. When it's on the LC meter, I hit, I hit the coil with hot air and see what happens to the inductance in the coil. Really, it doesn't move. It does move very slightly, but it moves up, which is the way it's supposed to, because it's supposed to have a positive temperature coefficient, right? So that, that the coil is not the problem. Then I said, okay, the problem's got to be in the capacitors. And I've got a bank of capacitors in there, because I usually like to put, you know, five or ten of them in parallel, right? And I realized that there were a couple in there that really looked kind of small and weren't marked clearly. So those, those were my suspects. I took them out of the circuit, lifted them off the, off the Manhattan pad, and put the hot air gun on it. And it didn't move. The capacitors, these are all NPO caps now. It didn't move. When I put the two smaller ones back in and hit it with the air gun, it moved like crazy. The problem were the two small caps. So this is sort of a, a very simple kind of temperature compensation series of tests. I then said, okay, well, I got to replace these two small caps. The only thing I had that was in the right range was uh, old, old silver micas that I have in a box. Now, silver micas get mixed reviews in terms of their temperature coefficient. Some people say that they're really good. Some people say they're really bad. So I did the same test. I took the silver mica cap that I was planning on using and put it in the LC meter. And then I hit it with a whole lot of heat from the hot air gun. So hot that the, the outside of the capacitor was a bit, a bit, bit too hot to touch. It's really hot. It didn't move. The capacitance stayed the same. Boom, that goes in the rig. This, this, now, this thing now is really stable. I mean, it, it's, it just sits there, even with the brass screw in it. So it's, and, and also, Farhan predicted that you would get about 20 kilocycles, 20 kilohertz per turn of the screw, right? So that means to get across the band, you're going to need eight or nine turns, right? But that's pretty good. That, and, that's, and, and not only that, I found that I measured it. I went and measured how much frequency, how much frequency delta you were getting for per turn of the screw. And during the range, over the range that I was interested in, which is about, you know, 200 kilohertz, um, it was consistently, in my case, 20 kilohertz per turn. So it wasn't, there was no bunching up problem. It wasn't like at the bottom end, you know, one turn would give you 60 kilohertz. It was 20, 20, 20, 20 all the way through. So that was another mark in, in, its, in its favor. So really stable and with linear tuning. So some real possibilities here. But Pete, this raises a question. 
And that is, is this really a permeability tuned oscillator? We were talking about this over lunch at the Vienna Wireless Society. And one of the guys in the club said, you really can't call it a permeability tuned oscillator because you're using uh, a brass screw in there. And I checked it out. Brass has the same permeability as air, right? So you're replacing air with brass. But when you do that, you're not changing the permeability. So can you call it? A, it, it definitely screwing the, uh, the, the, the brass in there has the effect of change in frequency. But Frank Harris writes that what's going on is it's the, it's the equivalent of putting uh, a, a shorted secondary into the circuit. If you put a shorted secondary in the circuit, that'll it'll change the frequency too. So I think the guy we were talking to at the club, Lee, was correct when he said that we shouldn't call it a permeability tuned oscillator. So do we just call it a variable inductor or we need, we may need some new acronym. I, I throw this out to our listener. What do you think, Pete? PTO or not? Uh, six one half dozen the other, you know, it's I'm, just, a, it's, it's PTO is gen generic, you know, it's a PTO. Uh, that's it. Everybody kind of knows what that means. It's got, it's got a screw instead of a, instead right. of a capacitor. But technically I think, I think Lee was right that the permeability it's not changing. Now, some of them, you'll see that they actually have a piece of um, ferrous material, either powdered iron, probably powdered iron. And when that goes in, that really does change the permeability of, of the coil. Uh, so, uh, well, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, this is all part of uh, VFO madness, of course. So I've had VFO. I, I know you consider this madness because it's analog stuff, and <laughs> I, I know, I know, I know. It's just you know different, different strokes for different folks here. But uh, I, I again, following your advice, I went out onto eBay and bought what I thought would be just another tuning capacitor from an old, dead Helicrafters HT thirty seven. But when the guy sent it to me, the box was unusually big. I mean, big the capacitor and when i opened it up i realized that he had sent me the entire not only the capacitor but all of the circuitry for the vfo out of a helicrafters ht37 everything except the tube and i started thinking well i don't want to put a tube in there because this is going to go into a solid state rig can i can i solid state this thing and so I managed to, I figured out how to do it with an FET going in there in, in, in the place of the, I think the 6AU6 that they had in there before. And I plugged the FET, get in there, got it powered and everything else. And, and, and man, it, it, it works like a charm. It, it really, really is nice. I will use this in a future rig. It, it tunes from 5 to 5.5 megahertz, which is really useful for a lot of different purposes. Oh, yeah. But I knew that this would, would, would strike a nerve <clears throat> with some of our... Thermatron aficionado friends. Grayson. <laughs> and it, it, it hurt. It hurt Grayson. He sent me a note and it was very short. He says, he says, all I can say is you've gone completely out of your mind. Enough said. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, when I, when I posted this, I put like a, I put like in the head of the blog post, I put trigger warning. If you're likely to be upset, you know, if you're likely to be upset by this, uh, do not, um, do not watch this thing because it could be bad. Hold on, hold on a second. Okay, where the phone call? Um, but anyway, it, uh, the trigger warning was there. So anyway, uh, but, it, well, wait a minute. He's the guy that's building an SI fifty three fifty one VFO. Grayson, go. There you go, Grayson. How about that? How about yeah. that, my friend? You know. Hold on a second. I gotta, I gotta get rid of this. People are calling me on the phone. Hello, I'll have to call you back. Okay. There you go. They're they're calling about Guap, Guap, Guapo the dog. His his um, heartworm test is coming in. I'm sure it's okay. I took him in anyway. Guapo the dog. Anyway, uh, yeah. So Grayson is building an SI fifty three fifty one. Man, I know. I don't know. Okay. Hey, speaking of which, now this gets this gets to subject another subject that you you you're so responsible for almost all of this stuff, Pete. 
And and one of the things I've known that you've been com- concerned about with analog VFOs is bunching up of the frequency dial. Not only are they unstable, but they have a tendency when you're tuning them and you get up to the high end of the band and all of a sudden, Pete's making the sign, like all well, it's bunched together, bunching up. And I've experienced that. I have it on my Lafayette receiver. Uh, Hammerland receivers, the SP series was infamous for this. But others, not so much. The HT37, if you look at that dial, man, there is a set number of kilocycles between each increment on that dial. It's completely linear. And even the Hammerland HQ100 that I have here in front of me, pretty linear in its tuning. So the question is, how come, and you raise this question, how come certain U.S. manufacturers cracked the code on this way back in the 50s? At the same time. And others did not. Yes. So I went out onto the um, Antique Radio Forum, and I found, as, as, as usually happens with these things, you find guys who really know what they're talking about and guys that, that really don't. So one guy who really knows what he's talking about, and I'll mention him later on, but he actually came up with a calculator that you could plug in various values of capacitance, inductance, trimmer caps, and patter caps, and then see what the dial would look like. Would it be bunched up or not? Now, the guys who don't know what they were talking about jumped to a conclusion. And one guy put up a, a note there, and he said, well, the, the Hamelin SP series, series was infamous for bunching up. But other rigs, and he mentioned the Yesu FT-101, used an analog VFO, but was completely linear in its tuning, which is true. Where he got in trouble is he said, so they must have been using a specially veined capacitor. You know, we've all seen these old old style capacitors called SLF, straight line frequency, or SLW, straight line wavelength. These are not capacitors where the, it, what, it, what it means is as you turn the knob, you get a, the same change in frequency per rotation or per, per angle change in the knob. So you don't get the bunching up. They made these capacitors by the, millions back in the days when they were putting them into AM broadcast radio so you wouldn't have bunching up at either the high end or the low end. Um, so he concluded that if because the, the Yesu didn't have the bunching up, they must be using one of these special capacitors. And for a while, I believed it. But then I said, wait a second, that can't be true. And I because I, I, I remember looking inside the capacitor. Right through the top, you can look at it. it Look at the capacitor in the, I even opened up the case, and you look at the capacitor inside the VFO from the ASU FT-10101, and it is not one of these special capacitors, right? It's much closer to a conventional, what they call SLC, straight line capacitance capacitor. And so talking to the guy with the website who lets you predict the bunching up or the not bunching up, I came to realize that you could you could take a regular standard old capacitor and with the proper selection of trimmer and padder, make the tuning completely linear. It can be done. It requires a little bit of of planning, a little bit of cut and try, but his website and his calculator makes this all a lot easier, but, but it can be done. The other reason I I began to suspect that the solution was not in the use of special capacitors is because you never see them mentioned in the literature. I mean, um, Wes Hayward, Doug Dumas, Rick Campbell, others would have mentioned this in books like SSDRA or EMRFD. You would have seen them when they, when they t- or Doug Dumas when they were talking about how to make a capacitor. There's all kinds of things about the capac- the variable capacitor you should select. Yeah, bronze veins are better. It's better to have ball bearings at both ends. It should tune smoothly, all this stuff. But never once do you see them say, oh, and if you want linear tuning, you should use an SLF or an SLW capacitor. They never say that. If that was really the solution, you'd see it. So I was, I spent some time fooling around with the calculator and, uh, got, you know, I got a good feel, a better feel for what it takes to, to have linear tuning, but Pete, I'm happy to report 
that it is possible with an analog EFO not to have the bunching up. Yeah, well, there's nope. rigs that are, you know, have solved that problem. That's Galaxy, it. Galaxy was another one. Yep, they, yep, yep. It was a linear dial. It was good, and so it it can be done. So you were the one who, who raised the issue, and I'm I'm glad that we, we we've kind of kind of cracked the code on that. I think. Hey, uh, one thing I want to do before we get to um, the shameless commerce division, because we have another sponsor to talk about. One of the things I try to do periodically is to work on the workshop, work on the bench, and after I finish a project, I'll sit back and think, okay, what tools do I need? What parts do I need? What you know? What what can I do to increase the kind of the effectiveness, the efficiency of the workbench? Now, there's a guy Adam Savage who used to be on MythBusters. He was one of the two guys on MythBusters, the TV show, and he wrote a whole book on workbenches and workshops, tools, how to use tools. Now he's he was mostly into kind of fabricating stuff for the TV and the movie industry, props, models, spaceships, things like that. But a lot of what he says in the book applies to the kind of workbenches that we all have. And so I've been reading Adam's book, and there's some real good advice in there about tools to use. And so inspired by, I have a link to his book. It's on the left-hand column of the Solder Smoke page. But based on what he said, I started thinking, and I've upgraded. I, I, got, a, I got a proper bench power supply that I haven't had for a long time. But now I have a, a proper bench power supply that's not a switching power supply. It's got a transformer in it. And it gives a good readout of what the voltage is and how much current the thing is pulling. So it's very, very useful. I got some better side cutters. I got some engineer ruler, engineering rulers, which are really good. I got some digital calipers and better solder. You know, one of the things, you know, we, we're in solder smoke here. We should, we should know about solder. But I, I've been just buying whatever solder I could get from whatever Chinese distributor was on Amazon. And some of this stuff is, I think, of dubious specs and quality. They'll claim that it's 6040 rosin core, but when then you use it, it doesn't look quite as shiny as the old regular Kester 6040 rosin core. So I got that. I mean, I got, you know, I, was, I thought about doing this because one of the guys in the club is Ron WA6YOU. Uh, who knows all about solder and he's a real authority on this. And I was talking to him and he was, he was saying, you know, use the Kester solder. I think he goes a little bit towards, you know, 6337, something like that. But I found 6040 and, and Kester and sure enough, it's, it's a lot nicer. So yeah, it's good to spend some time thinking about the tools of the trade, the craft, the way the workbench is organized. Pete, shameless commerce division. Yeah. Yes. You have any, anything to say about the the workbench workshops or anything? Any ideas there? Well, I'm sorry. I'm you, you're kind of right. fast. I, time is tight. Yeah, you're you're right. Recently, I bought a few tools. Like a, I bought a really good pair of needle nose pliers, and what a difference! Yeah, it, it it's amazing. And they always say when you're buying tool tools, go with the good stuff. You know, one thing, one one piece of advice that that Adam Savage gives, he says, if you're not sure whether you really need the tool or not. During the first iteration, you could buy the cheap one and see if you're going to use it a lot. If you are using it a lot, get rid That's of the better one. It's a good one. It's a good, kind of a good approach because sometimes, you know, you're not quite sure what you need a tool. You could buy a tool and use it once and then, you know, it, but if you buy a tool and you're using it three or four times a year, probably a good idea to get the good one. Pete, uh, shameless commerce division. And I, this is something that I'm really happy to do because we're able to talk to about our, about our old friend, uh, Todd, uh, K7TFC out there in Portland, Oregon, is launching a company that I think is going to be of real interest to the Solder Smoke listeners. The name of the company is Mostly DIY RF. The website, Mostly DIY RF, all one word, dot com. Mostly DIY RF dot com. Man, he is going to be offering and is offering now already. They're available now. A bunch of kits that I think will be of real use and interest to the to the homebrew radio amateur. He's got a kit called UDVBM-1. There's in three versions. This is to replace an analog VFO with a digital VFO. Something that I'm sure you'll you'll really <laughs> appreciate there, Pete. <laughs> Pete said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got some uh, boards. He's got a, uh, a PGTIA broadband AIF amplifier. He's got a TIA. 
AGC IF amplifier, a termination insensitive amplifier with, uh, with, with AGC. He's selling dual gate MOSFETs. He's selling op amps with, made from discrete components. He's selling an eight pole QER crystal filter and an I2C rotary encoder. Looking down the line, he plans on offering some other items, a general purpose audio amp, a high cast IF amplifier with AGC, and uh, listen, there's going to be a special announcement regarding a Michigan Mighty Mike kit. Ooh. Stay tuned. I think you're going to appreciate this, this offer. It's related to the Color Burst Liberation Army. That's coming. Stand by on that. But, you know, uh, uh, Ty was telling me about the company. He says that mostly DIY RF offers hardware for hardware-defined radio, mostly hardware-defined radio, mostly HDR. He says that's not a comment on software-defined radio. SDR is cool and useful, and it has its place. But but Todd and his company are more oriented towards, more a little bit more oriented towards hardware-defined radio. He says, in fact, he believes in explicitly making use of technology from all eras, vacuum tubes, discrete semiconductors, and integrated circuits. So it's kind of a a mixture of old tech and new tech, which I think is very much in keeping with what solder smoke is all about. And then he gets to the question of what does mostly DIY mean? It means that what you want to you, uh, but it, it means, it means making what you want and using ready-made for the rest. That's it. Making what you want and using ready-made for the rest. Even the most fanatic DIYing home brewer does this without much thought. He uses components he didn't fabricate. I feel like he's talking to me, talking about me here. Electricity he didn't generate. That's why I don't build power supplies. And theoretical knowledge he didn't discover. That's right. I didn't invent the coal pits oscillator. No, coal pits did. All right. Um, one, can, one can't fight all battles. One has to choose which to fight and which to leave to others. If an appliance operating ham doesn't want to fight it all, that's okay. But mostly DIY RF has nothing to offer him. Ooh. So yeah, I think that's a it's a good approach, and I think Todd Todd is gonna gonna have big success with this company. I think it's gonna be something that's gonna really resonate with uh, with with homebrew hams. A lot of uh, he fills a lot of need. Again, it's mostly DIYRF.com. What do you think, Pete? Yeah, matter of fact, uh, you sent the link. I took a look at some of those boards. They look really nice. The crystal filter board. Really, really, really nice, nice looking. Yeah. Check it out. I mean, and, and he's got a link to you. Could, you could buy it right from eBay from, from his page. You go from his page, yeah. you, you click buy from eBay now, and boom, Bob is your uncle. There you go. Hey, uh, a couple other uh, shameless commerce things. I, I, I continue to need YouTube viewing hours. <laughs> to keep the YouTube people happy, I got to have more viewing hours. I'm getting there. I need 4,000 viewing hours. I have about 3,100, so we're getting there. So, and what I'm doing to try to encourage people to increase their viewing hours is I'm taking old podcasts and putting them up. But Peter, I was just saying that uh, Peter, GW4ZUA, he's the guy with that really cool looking Radcom rig. And the, the, the box now holds a three band version of the Pete Giuliano Simple Seaver. So, I mean, it's always good when your ideas get used. Uh, Bruce, KC1FSZ, building a 25-watt amplifier. Hey, uh, Bruce, we're not going to turn you into the QRP authorities, okay? Unless I hope they're not listening. They're going to they're gonna be after you. 25 watts is beyond the limit, old man. Um, hey, we mentioned Grayson before. You know, I sent Grayson the 12BY7 from my DX100 because he's got some tube testers. I think he's got most of the tube testers in North America in his at his house. He's got a TV7. That's the military. He can't he can, beat that. He can beat that. But we had suspected that my 12 BY7 in the DX100 had gone toes up. And I got emails from a bunch of people who said, that doesn't happen too often. They're pretty reliable right. tubes. Right? I, I, I sent it to Grayson. He said it tested weak. Oh, okay. There you go. So, oh, so there's a bad 12 BY7. A, thanks for that. Thank you, Grayson. Um, and I'm sorry about, you know, solid stating of HD 37. <laughs> These things happen. But you're building an SI-5351, so I don't, I don't do that. Um, hey, Charles Smith, 
is is has been in the lead on how to solid state old tube gear and i put up a a, a link he's got an amazing youtube channel where he comes up with really an ingenious way to make tube replacements solid state replacements for the tubes and he uses a very simple device that we all have around these things that you screw into the drywall so that you could hang a picture on drywall it's like a white plastic thing it's about an inch and a half two inches long and he uses that he recreates the pins and then he mounts the transistor circuit on top he uses the voltage from the heaters to power the transistors and and the rig that that he's been using to, to solid state it's kind of ironic but he goes with the r390 and you'd, you'd think on the surface that might not be a great rig to do this with but most of the kind of the uniqueness of the R390 is in that mechanical kind of the the, the, the mechanical arrangement that, that keeps all the circuits tuned on the same frequencies. So, so actually, it's pretty good rig to solid state. And, and he's done that with a number of them, although I know that this is just causing great anxiety among the Thermotron fans. Hey, um, I got an email, Pete, from Gianfranco, Italy Zero Zulu Yankee, who is my old friend from Rome. He's an amplifier manufacturer, uh, and it was great to get in touch with him again. Got in touch with him through one of these old smoke podcasts that I put up there. It was good to hear from him. Uh, Paul WA1MAC is getting started after a long hiatus. Welcome back, Paul. Uh, Vasily. Oh, yeah, our old friend Vasily. Oh, no, no, I mean Todd. Todd, VE7BPO, always providing great uh, technical information. Spasibo, Vasily. Thank you, Todd. Mark, WB8YMV is building a super hat on 455KC. And finally, the last piece of, 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 uh, of a mail from the mailbag is from Farhan. I sent Farhan some comments that his Daylight Video, uh, Daylight Again video had stirred up. And he wrote back, I marvel at their stamina. Their ability to watch an hour-long video of a man talking with a funny accent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Brian, no, man, you don't have the funny accent at all. You, you, you're making great sense there. Hey, Pete, you were going to tell us about um, your your own uh, 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 bench activities, Resurrections, an SBE33, a 10 Tech Model 4, 540, and a KWM1. What's going on? Yeah, yeah. Hey, hey first I want to make a note. A note here, we we both got an email from Pete Eaton about W7ZOI, and he sent us some pictures of his shack. It came off of W7ZOI's website. Yes. And predominant in in amongst the homebrew radios is an ICOM seventy three hundred, a Yesu FT seven, and an Alacraft KX two. So. What's going on? <laughs> the king of homebrew, the master, <laughs> is now got an ICOM 7300. What's going on? Tell you, Farhan has an ICOM 7300. You kidding? I think it's a 7300. It's some sort of ICOM. Oh, and wow. It, and, 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 and he has confessed. Uh, you know, I, 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 what can I say? I find it disturbing too. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to criticize. I, I, I would have never thought you would use what's a word in the pints boxes in the same sentence. I don't know. It's, it's, it's. You know, I, I guess my reaction is is similar to when Grayson found out that I was H, I was solid studying the HT thirty seven VF. Yeah, yeah. You have to, you have to, you have to say, hey, look, to each his own. We all make our decisions here. Look. I have a storeboard antenna now. Yeah, heck- yeah, but that's <laughs> just a little bit different. Anyway, so noted, so noted. Okay, good. Okay, all right. So, Resurrection Radio. I behind me, my right behind me is a Temple One. There was a basket case. It was full of dirt, grime, dust, what have you. I picked it up for eighty-five bucks, and little time and energy, you know, off and on, fifteen minutes here, fifteen minutes there. I got the thing working, and and that's pretty good. You, I mean, uh, getting a radio for eighty five dollars that was essentially dirty, and I didn't replace some components. Um, I don't know, a dozen or so with capacitors were cracked. You could see, I say, hey, that's not a good idea. So anyway, if you if you know some stuff, <laughs> you can do some stuff. Get a radio. But here was the interesting thing about it. This radio was very popular with the CV crowd. 
they have a band switch that you put it in a 10 meter position and there's a secondary switch that has four crystal banks that cover essentially two megahertz of of 10 meters and a lot of people who were selling this radio also sold to the crystals so that you could put those four bands in there in the cb bands so i had never tested it on 10 meters because there was nothing on the band and the other day I put it in one of the 10 meter bands and suddenly it was alive. Then I realized it was a CV band. <laughs> <laughs> this is almost as bad as Wes in the 7300. Pete yeah. Giuliano's on the CV band. But, but here was the thing that's interesting. There was nothing on 10 meters, but this CV band, there were stations in Toronto, Canada, talking to stations in Mexico. Yeah. So, I mean, the 11 meter band was hot, which got to tell you the 10 meter band, which is right next door, was probably pretty hot, but there was nobody on. It was the same thing on the HQ100. I can tune the, the CB frequencies, but I could also go up a little bit higher and look what's happening on 10. And I was talking to a, a, a 10 meter fan from the Vienna Wireless Society, and he said that, yeah, I mean, the way guys will find out what's happening or what's available or what could happen on 10 is they listen to the CB frequencies. And if they hear, you know, distant stations coming in on 11 yeah. meters, they know 10 should be in good shape, I, but I it's, was, it is scary. Had the lack of activity though. Yeah. And, but this, this rig was very popular because all you do is solder crystal in your on, on 11 meters. Anyway, it's kind of interesting. So I got that work. Then I found an SBE 33 for $45. Sent me one. I have it here. Yeah, I still have it. forty-five dollars. And I said, the filter, the, the mechanical, mechanical filter is worth the forty-five dollars. So you sent me the SBE rigs for the mechanical filters, but I just didn't have the heart to rip them out of these things because these rigs are so they're beautiful and they're such an important part of sideband history. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, for forty-five dollars, I I did uh, I replaced twenty capacitors because I have worked on a lot of C uh, SBE rigs, and so I bought capacitors in bulk so i didn't have to spend any money i just went into the bin got the 20 capacitors and replaced them and, and then things on the air and it's working working really fine so i mean if you can do a little judicious shopping you can do that so i i'm all i'm saying is it, it works perfect with my current schedule because i can spend 15 20 minutes and work on something and then not have to worry about oh i got to build something more so anyway, it was kind of fun to bring those things back to life and put them on the air. And then you get on the air and say, oh, yeah, I'm running in. Guy says, yeah, I'm running a hybrid rig here. And I said, so am I. He says, oh, yeah. I said, he says, mine's about 1980. I said, mine's 1961, <laughs> you know, which is kind of fun. Uh, on the Tentec 540, actually, it was something I did a long time ago. But one of the people that you mentioned in the mailbag, is getting back on the air after a hiatus, and he had a 10 Tech 540, and he said, gee, I'd like to get back on the air, but the dial, dial cord is broken. And so I sent him an email back and says, if you go to Amazon and look in the area where they make have jewelry, they have this elastic string yeah. that they use for beading, put the beading on. If you get yeah. the uh, 0.8 millimeter, it works perfect. You can restring the dial. I said, so you can put that radio back on the air. It'll cost you eight bucks. It's 10 lifetimes worth, worth and, of supply. And believe me, when you restring the dial on one of these rigs, it makes you feel closer to the thing. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I have restrung the string on the Drake 2B so many times that I've gotten good at it. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it made me, he said, you can't buy the dial string from Tentec anymore. Well, but here's a substitute, and I know it works because I've actually done it. So I, I think Antiques Electronic Supply still sells dial string, too. That might be another source. Yeah, I, yeah. Because I, I, I have a sprue of it. I, I've used so much of it on the Drake 2B. I've worn those strings yeah. out. Yeah. Uh, and that is, a, that is a, a lost skill, restringing the dial string. I mean, you know, if, if, you, if your radio has strings in it, you know, you're, you, you know you're you back in the... You can do an S3080 blindfold, just like... Take a strip, you know, field stripping a 45. You can do the S3080 blindfold. But, but anyway, M1, you're in a KWM1? Yeah, yeah. Well, I've been doing some work on it. Inexplicably, the receiver is working fine and the transmitter won't transmit. And and I it's got me stumped because uh, I watched there's a great YouTube video about a guy that says doesn't transmit, go look at the screen supply on the 6146s. And he went through this whole process and I said, 
maybe that's it. So I checked, no, that's not, and it was a relay. The screen supply is normally not connected to the 6146s. When you transmit, the screen is supplied through the relay. It was dirty contacts, clean up the contacts to solve the problem. That wasn't it. So I'm still hunting on why it doesn't, it works on receive. So all the common circuits are working fine. It just doesn't work on transmit. And, and I know it's not the finals. I know it's not the driver. As a matter of fact, uh, little trick that I've done here, which you can do with uh, some vacuum tubes, uh, is just make a loop and put it around the tube and connect it to your oscilloscope and see if you're seeing the sideband signal. So, I mean, I can trace the sideband signal all the way up to the driver, although it's not very strong. So I'm suspecting that somewhere in the chain there might be a coupling capacitor. Yeah. It's just not putting enough juice. I mean, it's enough signal that you can detect it, but not enough to drive the 6146s. So... But, you know, with limited time, there's only so much you can do, and so you're kind of stuck. Well, it's good that these things are broken because it gives you something to work on. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll look on the bright side. <laughs> yeah. And I, I got a, on, on my blog, I got a project here, another sideband transceiver. And so I am been trying to document the elements so that there's a compendium of information. If you go to the N6QW uh, website, N6QW.com, there's a link in there that I've collected everything off of the blog into a PDF document. So you can print it's 67 pages, so you can print it out. But I'm and it covered all the elements. There's enough information there that if you wanted to build something, you could do it. Well, that's really important. It's good because sometimes things stuff gets lost in the blog because it, it, it I find that I've I've posted things over a period of time and it's hard to pull them all together. So pulling them together like that makes it very, very useful. Yeah. So yeah. there you go. Tribal knowledge from Pete Giuliano. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's it. That's what's on my bench. All right. No, I don't it? have a my bean doesn't work, so I can't compete with you on BXCC. I'm, I I think you you, you got to get some sort of directional antenna up there, Pete. Something you know, it's got it's yeah. so, so cool. Listen, I'm gonna turn the beam. You hear it? There, it's turning right now. You can probably hear it in the background. Oh man, I'm swinging it's like it. Life in the heart. <laughs> hey, uh, hey um, I, I'm trying to get Dean to buy a hex beam. I, I took a picture of the one over my house. I said, look, you can hardly even notice it, which was a bit of an exaggeration, <laughs> but uh, it could happen. Well, you know, he sent some pictures of his backyard, and I guess his backyard backs up to a common area. So you know have the guy behind you looking at your, your beam because there is no one, <laughs> nobody behind him. He needs, he needs one of these things. He needs yeah. one. All right, well, let's get Dean, and we'll get you a directional into hex beam, got a hex beam. Yeah. All right, Pete. Hey, listen, I know you got to go duty calls. Thanks for taking the time out to talk to us this morning. You bet. Seven threes from the left coast. Seven threes from Northern Virginia. Thanks, Pete.